And now, it is time to get to our uh, media panel. Jonathan Green, Peter Jones, Bob Pockris, and Rolf Shaheen. To the podium, please. All right. We've made it to the end of the day, and doggone it, we're on time even. Now we'll really screw that up with this next group. Because nobody knows how to speak better than uh, these fellas up on the stage. And if I ended up crashing during my performance here at RTBC today, if I just was sprawled out on the floor, body parts flailing, the next guy is the play-by-play -play man that I would want to call that crash for me. Because his distinctive voice and exciting race calls have been featured on racing events all over the world and many different sports too, although I'm really wondering how the heck you make cricket sound interesting. From Speed City Broadcasting, Jonathan Green. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, young man. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. If you do keel over, I'll be ready. Um, <laughs> oh no, man, no, I won't do it. Um, but um, yeah, I come from England, as you might, might uh, understand by the accent, but I'm actually now a, a native Austinite. Uh, working at the Circuit of the Americas, uh, working for GRC, um, working around the world. I'm off to New Zealand in January, um, and um, I'm a regular visitor to the Indy 500 as well. So, um, yeah, I get around a bit, you could say, um, but now um, based here in the USA, and Speed City Broadcasting is what we formed in Austin, um, and we've been going since, uh, well, uh, since about six months before the Circuit of the Americas came to be, so that what, that is what Speed City Broadcasting was sort of based upon in the in the beginning, and, and uh, I've been with them from the start, and it's been a lot of fun. I've got him trained. Good. All right, our next guest. When it comes to knowing who's who in the world of Formula One, nobody does it better than our next guest from Sports Pro Media, home of the Black Book. It's Peter Jones. Thanks, guys. Peter, Thanks tell us a little bit about the Black Book Forum. Sure. Um, well, firstly, congratulations on a fantastic conference, Tim and the team. It's, it's excellent. It's quite an interesting balance up here on stage between European motorsport knowledge and US motorsport knowledge. Uh, when I say European, obviously now uh, with Brexit, we've decided to float away and drown ourselves in the Atlantic. Um, but there we go. Um, so no, uh, I'm the business director of, of the Black Book of Motorsport and we are a 360 degree media business. So print, which you see some of our books around, hopefully you enjoy them. Um, uh, digital and events and our event you might have seen a video uh, about earlier. So uh, we're very much connecting the motorsport industry at top level. So we have relationships with Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR, uh, Supercars in Australia, Formula E, MotoGP and Rally and Le Mans. So yeah, good, good crowd. All righty, nobody outworks our next guest when it comes to the NASCAR Media Center. I have tried to show up really early for races, and Bob is there. I have tried to stay really late processing photographs and everything else, and he's still there but he's also the best in the business when it comes to the NASCAR reporting world from ESPN, Mr. Bob Pockers. Thanks, Dennis. Um, I said I'm Bob Pockers with ESPN. I'm an Indiana native, went to my first Indy 500 in 89. Uh, after going to Indiana University, I worked for the Daytona paper for 12 years, covered every Daytona 500 since 1992. And my claim to fame is I have my own Indiana double. This butt cheek has been chewed out by Bob Knight. This butt cheek has been chewed out by Tony Stewart. <laughs> and the one thing that I can guarantee is that no matter how tough of a question that I throw at this man, I can't get any reaction out of him because I know Kurt Busch never has been able to. 
All righty, our final guest. I don't want to suggest that he's been covering motorsports for a long time, but this man still uses an AOL email address. <laughs> you can follow all of his work over on his MySpace page, of course. But he is part of the team that saved the National Speed Sport News brand from extinction. And he's the only speaker other than Tim Frost and myself with an absolute perfect attendance record here at RTPC. Ralph, it's great to have you back again. Thank you, Dennis. Well, it's great to see so many uh, friends here. Uh, we get to see each and every year here at RTBC. It's great to have you all back here and good to be back with you again. Uh, of course, Speed Sports started in 1934. Hopefully, uh, some of you saw it somewhere along the way. I doubt anybody has the first issue in the room. Um, but uh, yeah, we have turned that into a full-blown media company. We do a uh, little bit of everything. 26 different television shows this year for MAV TV. We produced uh, about 10, 8 to 10, I believe, for our friends at the World of Outlaws as well this season for CBS Sportsnet. Um, we do magazines, website, all of that. And going into January, when I drop the gate for the first time at Anaheim for the first uh, Supercross of the year, I will be holding a microphone on national TV for my 30th year. I didn't think it'd be 30 months. <laughs> or 30 days. There you go. All right. Uh, we're going to start off at this side. We're just going to go down the road with this first question. Now, I know you've done more than motorsports, but obviously staying in motorsports, you must like us more. Uh, but what is it about motorsports? Why did you choose this to cover? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I often, <laughs> late at night, wonder the same thing. Because um, you're right, I, I started off, I, I actually went to college here in the, in the USA uh, at SMU in Dallas, which is how I have my sort of, uh, sort of Texas connection. But I studied broadcast, so I, I have. I've covered darts, snooker, cricket, as you mentioned, uh, NFL even. Um, but motorsport just kept coming back, and I think it also found me. I think my energy, my enthusiasm, and my passion for it, um, I, 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 I guess, like probably most of the panel, I wanted to be a racing driver, but I didn't have the money. Um, and those that do, do, and those that can't perhaps talk about it. And I'm one of those guys. Um, I absolutely am enthralled by uh, racing driving and racers, and I know I probably couldn't do it, uh, which is probably why I talk about it, because I do hold them in great esteem. Uh, and I think that comes across in my commentary, or I hope it does, because I, um, I want to be that guy um, ever since I was a five-year-old, you know? Um, and so um, I think that I have a lot of appreciation for what they do. I think I understand it now a little bit better. I've, I've obviously been around it long enough, and almost as long as Ralph. Um, but I think that's really my, is, is a passion for it. Um, I think they are... Uh, drivers themselves are underestimated as athletes in the modern world um, compared to, say, tennis players or NFL players or soccer players. Um, I, f I always find that one of my big uh, things when, when talking about is getting those helmets off and talking about the human being that is, is going around turn three, uh, the Indy 500, because he is just a human being. So uh, sometimes we can forget that when there's crashes, when there's worse and so, yeah, I, I, I like to try to keep the humanization of, of, the, of our sport um, very much at my forefront, uh, and hence the excitement. <laughs> Peter, why motorsports? I think for me, it's, again, it's, it's all about passion. So, you know, being, being sort of surrounded by Formula One since I was very young, you know, it was on in the background when I was a kid. Um, and my, my granddad worked for, for MG Rover as a mechanic. So it was always kind of in, in, in the lifeblood of my family. Um, and for me, it's about, you know, the human element of the sport as well. It's about um, the ability to, you know, Formula One generates 5G going around a corner. How is that possible for a, for a human being to cope with it? It's like it's almost jet fighter style G-forces. Um, and, you know, going, driving through a, a forest at 95 miles an hour in a rally car where you've got people lining the side of the road. One false move, you could die, they will die. Um, but, you know, they're heroes, I think. So it's, it's the human element for me. Um, in terms of doing this for uh, for a living, basically I just fell into the job, so uh, it just landed landed really. So yeah, pretty happy. All right, Mr. Pockers, you'd made a hell of a uh, political reporter covering the White House. 
especially right now. Uh, <laughs> why motorsports? Well, I think as, the, as these guys talked about, it's the human element. And I often talk to people when they, talk, when they ask me about covering motorsports, I say, you know, in football, we can see how far somebody throws the ball. In basketball, we can see how high somebody can jump. But I can't interview an engine. As much as I'd like to interview an engine, I can't. I can't interview suspension pieces. I don't know exactly why somebody was fast. But we can talk about, you know, the, the drama aspect of it. You know, who, who's angry with who? Who is angry with their team? Who might get let go? Is it Chevy, Ford, Dodge, Toyota? You have a whole manufacturer loyalty. Still, I think, in this country, a little bit at least. And I think all those different storylines is really what keeps you coming back. I, I knew I found the place to be when I asked Jeff Gordon. It was the first Brickyard 400, and I asked him, I said, hey, did you ever skip school, you know, a senior skip day, coming to the Speedway, you know, to, to watch practice? And he looked at me and said, do you speak from experience? And I said, the, the, these are the kind of people I want to be around. Okay, Ralph. Well, I think for all of us in this entire room, it's basically the same thing. We experienced something at one point in time or another that just lit the fuse, if you will. Might have been a pair of Nitro Funny Cars going down the drag strip. Might have been the green flag at a World of Outlaws sprint car race. Might have been the first gate drop at a Supercross. Whatever it was, they were unleashed upon you, and it took over all of your senses, and you were never the same. And once that happens, you can't get away from it. Now you're hooked. And then you just got to find your path from there. For some of us, it became running racetracks or uh, driving or running a motor company and, and setting up all their, their racing teams. But we were just completely addicted from that point forward. For me, it ended up being on the side of talking. Um, I always had an interest in sports casting and that side of it. Uh, like Jonathan, I wanted to be Mario and because Mario was one of the first things I saw live wheeling a, uh, a dirt car around and I was done. But I figured I wasn't going to be Mario, so what's the next best option? For me, it was broadcasting. That was another thing I had passion and I was able to tie the two together. So there's a green flag or a gate drop somewhere, and from that moment, it's done. All of these uh, gentlemen up on the stage have an unbelievably impressive resume. And we as fans of their work might have a particular moment in time that we remember. But I'm going to ask you guys the most unfair question of the night. If you had to boil it down to one accomplishment in your career, which one made you the most proud? Not necessarily the one that got you the most attention, but what was that moment that you said, yep, I got that one right? <laughs> oh, um, this, oh, that's a very hard question. Um, that's why I'm here yeah, asking the question. And I get, I get to do it first. Ralph! Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll what, go. What do you think? Go sure, ahead. sure. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a few moments that stand out where you ask a particular question or, or things just went right. I'm hoping when uh, my career is all said and done, uh, the thing that maybe we, because it's a team effort, get remembered for the most is for truly saving speed sport and keeping it going um but if there's one moment from the broadcasting side that that jumps out for me um it's at daytona dale senior flips down the back stretch gets out of the car you've all seen the story looks at the car gets back out of the ambulance gets back in the car drives the car all the way back around parks it in the middle of the garage meanwhile jeff gordon goes on and and wins the thing and group of guys on our CBS crew go running for victory lane. And I yelled to the producer, I'll get Earnhardt. They said, great. So I go running around the corner and there's about a hundred journalists all standing around this heaping hunk of black jam good wrench painted up number three. And in the middle of it is Dale senior standing there. And I've got this live CBS show we're trying to wrap up. So I grab my cameraman and we dive through the pile 
And he sees me coming through the pile, and he knows that I'm working on that CBS show, and he knows we're live. And he points right at me. He goes, Ralph, what do you need? I said, I need you, and I'll go wherever you want to go to do that because we're in commercial. He goes, great. Let's go to the hauler. I said, okay. He comes blasting past by me and just pushing his way through the crowd as he would do. And he realizes he's lost me already. He reaches back and he grabs me on my belt loop and he pulls me through the crowd like this. And I'm like, I got her hurt. I got her hurt like this. And we get all the way to his hauler and he, he gets up on the back step of the hauler and there was a, a, an ice chest there and he gets up on this thing and he stands there and everybody starts, down, down, down. He goes, I'll get to all your questions but I'm not answering anybody's questions till I'm done with him. And when I'm done with him, we'll handle all the questions. Everybody's real crying. I'm like, oh my God, you know, okay, great. And then next thing you know, he leans down and he goes, what are they doing now? And I said, well, actually you're in that, that Bush commercial where you're walking down the back stretch at Darlington. And he goes, oh yeah, you know, that day we were doing, and he just like, he and I are just having this individual conversation with a hundred guys standing around us. And then they finished the commercial, came down to me, we inter do the interview, and then off we went. And that really means something to me because it, it never translated to anybody at home watching. But we got the interview we had to get. This was a mega moment in the history of Dale Earnhardt. And what meant the most to me was the fact that he had, I had earned his respect, and that he took the time and set all that up when everybody else was worthy of a question too. So for me, that's a moment that uh, meant a lot to me that probably would never get translated out. Next victim. <laughs> I think the proudest moments are the times when I'm sitting in a restaurant and either a highlight of a race goes on or you know, back when I was working in Daytona, you'd just be in the, you know, somebody, you'd just overhear conversation and you'd hear people talking about a story you wrote. I mean, and, and to hear them, you know, to say, hey, hear them talk to their friends and say, hey, but did you know this? And you know that it came from your story. I think to me, those are the proudest moments. One of the greatest things that ever happened to me when I was a young journalist at Indiana University was I wrote about a crop walk. You know, simple 10 paragraph story that they're going to have this walk for hunger. And then when I went to the actual event, there were two people with the article signing up to walk. And I said, damn, the power of journalism. And to me, those are still the moments for, for, for me because we have, we have incredible power to impact people's lives. And their, their um, discretionary time and their discretionary income is so, um, so valuable. And if we can, any time we find out or I find out that I've impacted somebody's decision on what they're going to do that day, those are the days I'm most proud. Peter. Uh, well, for me, you know, I, I don't really have the uh, experience that these guys have uh, to a degree, so it's hard to define one moment. I think really for me it's, you know, the Black Book has been going for the better part of 20 years, and it was almost exclusively Formula One for more than 15 years. So for me to build relationships with, you know, the likes of Mark Miles, Brian France, Chase Carey, the, uh, you know, the, the, the managing directors and CEOs of these big businesses and grow the Black Book into... You know, motorsport is much bigger than Formula One, you know, whether you're from Europe or not. Um, even though a lot of the money in Europe flows into Formula One, a lot of fans, you know, follow rally. They follow, you know, drag racing. They follow uh, endurance racing. And by expanding that and building that network, I think I'm, I'm pretty proud of. <laughs> you passed the buck long enough. I did actually know what I was going to say, but I just wanted to throw Ralph onto the bus because I said I promised I would. Um, but... Um, you know, I think, to be honest, uh, the gift that keeps giving for me is, is the Macau Grand Prix. Uh, I just celebrated my 24th year, uh, and the crash you mentioned <laughs> was a good celebration, too, because it was big. Um, but it's also changed as an event. It's one of the oldest motorsport events. It goes back to 1954, um, and I started covering it in the early 90s. And why I say it's the gift that keeps giving is that uh, I, I took over from my hero, Murray Walker, uh, and James Allen, and so, you know, those were mighty boots to fill in my book, and if you're from Europe, you know, if you mention Murray Walker, that's, uh, that's pretty high, high uh, air. Uh, so I knew I had a responsibility, um, but I've given it 24 years, and they keep asking me back, so um, I keep going. But why I love it so much is the beauty of the event is 
uh, the headline is the Formula 3. And I know the Formula 3 of Americas is coming, and I hope it uh, gets into the same um, echelons that um, Formula 3 World Cup has in Macau, because all the young drivers uh, that are any worth any of their salt come to the Macau Grand Prix. And now with the World Cup for GTs as well, it's the same for them. Uh, it's always been that way. It's one of the few street races that also has bikes. Uh, it's a crazy event in the middle of China, the director of broadcasting is directing in Portuguese, Chinese, and English. And I'm listening to all this. Uh, there's been, I could, I could bore you with hours of my Macau stories, but the, but the abiding memory for me will always be the fact that young drivers, now with YouTube, um, listen to years and years of commentary and years and years of the Macau Grand Prix, not because of what we've been doing, but because it's such a famous track. Uh, and it's a bit like Ralph, when, when, when somebody uh, kind of hears your voice or recognizes, you know, that you were part of their event or a previous event. Uh, and they, I find that the funniest thing is when I, I meet a 19 year old for the first time and they've been around for a while, but they suddenly start quoting my Macau commentary. Um, to me, that, that is a very special, just as uh, you, know, you were saying earlier, it, it's such a, a special thing to, to think that people have even noticed. Uh, the best example I can give you is Robert Kubitzer. I was down at the Australian Grand Prix when he had just made it to Formula One. And if anybody knows Robert's career, and obviously it's back in the headlines, but just getting into Formula One was hard for him uh, because he was the first pole. He had no sponsorship. He went through V8s. He did everything. Um, but he was noticed at the Macau Grand Prix uh, by Mario Tyson. And anyway, he got through and, of course, joined BMW. And I remember he was walking along uh, the, the paddock. And if you know the Formula One paddock, it's pretty exclusive. There's not a lot of fans in there. It's pretty much the business. And you have to, you know, you have to get through the turnstile. Uh, and anyway, he's walking along with Mario and with uh, Flavio Briatore. And I see him out of the corner of my eye, and he sees me, and I kind of go, you know, I'll speak to you later. And he stops. He went, excuse me. He went, Johnny, let's talk Macau. And, and I, you know, to me, that was, you know, Flavio was like, who the, what, huh? You know, and these are the big guys. So I think to me, and it happens still to this day, young, young drivers coming up who remember those days when they weren't anybody important, and you made them important. And so that's been a big part of my life. Okay, guys, I'm going to throw this out as a toss-up question. Again, my dream of being a game show host, uh, unfulfilled as it always is until this moment. Uh, so I'm going to toss this out uh, from our lunch discussion with Jay Fry. I asked him this question. I'm going to ask it to you, and whoever wants to chime in can. What makes great racing? I'll try and go first. Um, I think what, what makes great racing is um, obviously strong competition. I think using the example of Formula One, as much as I love it, you know, you can look at, you can look at NASCAR and many other series and the racing is so much better. It's, it's close racing, I think. It's what makes great, great racing, you know, whether it's street circuit or, or oval racing, um, is essentially is having, you know, the, uh, the heroes all competing together alongside each other. And I just think when you've got a dominant team in a particular series, no matter what series that is, it's, it's negative. So it's close racing. And the reason this question got inspired both at lunch and here is I was having a discussion with a younger media member, and he tried to tell me that my logic about Dan Gurney still being right is so old-fashioned. Bob, what makes great racing? We're seeing it in NASCAR now where they're wanting to switch to the Roval at Charlotte, yeah. where Charlotte used to be the best track. Uh, I mean, I think, as, as Jay talked about, you need, to have, be able, you need to have to lift, right? You need to have, I think the best racing is racing where you don't feel like it's a total engineering exercise, and B, you feel like that it, there isn't one line that a driver has to run. So what, what makes Homestead great for the final NASCAR race of the season is because if you're bad in one area, you maybe you can move a little closer to the wall. If you're if you're bad when you're close to the wall, maybe you can move a little bit down the track. You have options, and I think that's I think that's what fans want to see. The, the hard part for all for everyone in here, I think, is how much does great racing matter, right? I, you know, Grand Am had great racing. The, the, there was no argument that Grand Am had great racing, but it just didn't resonate. And and what Formula One has, I think, is a manufacturer loyalty second to none right now in motorsports. 
and you know you're going to root for your Ferrari. And 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 now I always say that in Talladega. 10 years ago, every Chevy in the parking lot would have Calvin and Hobbes stickers pissing on a Ford logo, right? And every Ford would have Calvin and Hobbes stickers pissing on a Chevy logo. But, and, and through no fault of NASCAR, there, there's some, a lot of that's been lost. Now, certainly their cars don't look anything like those, or, or certainly not as much as they did in the past. So it's, it's not just whether somebody can pass and whether there's a pass for the lead in the last five laps. It's how much connection there is between those people who are watching at home, those people who are in the stands, and the people who are behind the wheel. I just want to quickly chime in with regards to the comment about the, the, the great racing um, with, with Panama, as you say. The, if you look at Formula E as an example, so Formula E has a great commercial model, um, races all over the world, has huge sponsors now, has all the big OEMs uh, attaching Porsche, Mercedes, uh, Nissan now are coming, coming on board. And they, you know, they're, they're very tech heavy, they're very, you know, social media led, uh, e-gaming, very innovative, yet they don't have a fan base. And part of that is because the racing is, is on street circuits, it's not very fast, it has zero noise, uh, and isn't that close. Uh, ultimately, I think great racing is the core component of a successful motorsport, and all the other elements need to be built around that. So you do need both elements, but without great racing, you won't be successful. Okay. Did you say you didn't like Formula E? As a race series, no. Dare okay. I say it, no. Okay. As a host of Formula E here in the United States. <laughs> oh. Well. I'm off. <laughs> I would tell you. Down goes Frazier. I would tell you. And, I, and I'm not, because I, look, I have no vested interest in Formula E. It makes no difference, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to get paid on the success or failure of Formula E. But I do get to see a bunch of it. I would tell you, it's got a tremendous amount of drama. And you can take racing and break it down into different things. And different things are going to excite different people and make people fans of whatever it is you're doing for different reasons. Drama might be one. Formula E comes with a ton of drama right now. They do have that. Tight confines, you don't know if the batteries are gonna last. Drivers who are very competent at what they're doing, a lot of wheel-to-wheel -wheel battling on a tight street circuit. There is a tremendous amount of drama there. The last race, they didn't know who was going to win until the last lap. And then after that, that guy got disqualified. So there's a lot of drama. Supercross doesn't have that kind of drama, but it's got a tremendous amount of energy. There's a wildness factor to it. Drop the gate, land rush to the first corner. Who the hell knows what's going to happen after that? We sure don't. And that's why everybody's hooked on it. Plus the fact it's 80% the rider, 20% the bike, which is a huge factor in why people like that particular form of racing. Because that rider with the biggest heart is the one who's going to win because he's willing to launch the bike a little bit further than the other guy. There are other forms of racing where it is too much the technical side of the, the scale and it impacts whether the car or the driver is really the deciding factor. And if it's the vehicle that's the deciding factor, it's probably not gonna be a really good thing unless it's Formula One and you're just into it because you love the technology side of the sport. And that's okay, that's totally fine. Does it make a great racing? Depends on what you think great racing is, but it doesn't mean it's not going to be successful, right? So. MotoGP, as Jonathan and I both know, is running a pretty fine balance there. They've got incredible technology, but they've also got riders who are unbelievably willing to hang it out there. And that can be fun to watch too. Sometimes they have just hellacious battles. Sometimes a guy wins by 15 seconds, but it's still beautiful to watch. And that beauty comes through, and that drives people to their van view because they just want to watch Marquez drift that bike through that corner, and you just sit there marveled at how he's able to do it. Yeah, the bike's doing a lot of it. So is he. So what is it that drives you? Well, the guy that likes a dirt late model race is not the same guy that likes watching Marquez most of the time. I might be the exception, okay? <laughs> 
Right. <laughs> I might be the exception. But it makes it very difficult to say what truly is great racing because not everybody is looking at it for the same thing. Okay? It's good. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I would say that, to be honest, I've sat here and listened to everybody else. Uh, for me, great racing, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually excited to have heard all the panelists today have come up almost with the same kind of um, synopsis, which is great storytelling and great drama is what makes great racing. And I think sometimes all of us involved in the industry, not just the people who are, if you like, on the front line with the microphone in front of them, but also everybody involved in, in the industry. Sometimes, and, and again, I want to reiterate, uh, the, the, uh, uh, Laurie, uh, great uh, entertainment. We're in the entertainment business, guys. That's what we're in. Um, if we were in the film business, I think it's easier because they don't have helmets on. You can see the faces, you can see the drama, you can see the tears. For us, it's a little bit harder because they've got helmets on. But let's face it, guys, this is, if we go back to prehistoric times and where sport was invented at the Olympics and Let's face it, gladiators. That's what we are. These guys are modern day gladiators, and I'm not the first to tell you that. But sometimes, like I said, another comment, don't overcomplicate it. We're in a fantastic business here, and sometimes we try too hard to, 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 to worry about the technology, to worry about the marketing of it. Uh, you know, like, like Ralph says, the, <laughs> you drop the green flag and there's a bunch of humans trying to all do the same thing. The drama is there in itself. And then if we're good at being journalists, we then tell the backstory. And I think in this modern age, the, the, the challenge, if you will, it, to, to, to make great racing is to make sure that we keep telling the backstory because the front story, the technology, the timing, the TV, the streaming, it's all there. Uh, we can't add to that. What we can add is the human interest and the, the excitement of what is effectively the ultimate drama. Dennis, can I spin that just a second for you here? Okay, so we were talking earlier about all these different forms of media and all these different things that are going on out there and how are you telling your stories and all that. So we've already talked about the fact that we've got drama, we've got excitement, we've got all these different things that can attract people to your venues, right? That's what, as promoters and sanctioning body people, you folks need to think a lot about and find partners to work with to help tell those stories for you. And I would tell you that social media is a good thing, but it's not your only thing. And here's one of the things I see wrong with social media these days as far as telling your stories. Social media is a great way to tell everybody, hey, tickets are on sale, hey, gates open at this time, and do some basic promoting that way and kind of remind everybody about what's going on. You can do little flash things and little videos and all that. But the one thing you can't do with social media is truly tell your story because it's you telling your story. You still got to be humble to a point. Okay. Let's take Bob Sargent for Bob or buddies. I can use you an example. Bob doesn't want to be the one always out there waving Bob's flag. He's got to do it to a point. But it reaches a point where all of a sudden the guy goes, man, this Bob guy's always talking about Bob. <laughs> it's best for Bob if Bob talks about Bob. Bob goes out of business. Only guy Bob's got to talk about Bob is Bob. Bob's got a problem at that point. Okay? The best person to tell Bob's story is a third person type scenario. When this Bob can sit there and tell a real story about how Bob Sargent has built a tremendously successful short track racing business and is one of the best promoters in the country. Oh, by the way, we did that in speed sport. <laughs> nice. But the point is that very thing. Because then somebody reads that article in speed sport and says, huh, it's pretty interesting. I need to, I need to learn more about Bob. And now they find Bob's website, they find Bob's Twitter page, they find all these other things that Bob is using to promote his track. So think about media in these ways too. Social media is great, and it definitely communicates to a younger crowd, there's no doubt about it. But don't forget about traditional forms of media too. Because ultimately, this whole room is in it together. And I think I might have said this in years past, but it's really, really true. If any one of the legs of the stool in this room come apart, we're all in trouble. 
If the sanctioning body goes down, then the racers have nowhere to go. If the racetrack closes, the sanctioning body and the racers have nowhere to go. If the media goes away, there's nobody talking about you. So you, everybody's got to support everybody in all these different ways. And it's very important that we find ways to do that. Okay, guys, I'm going to throw. Oh, go ahead. No, Jump no, on do you want to get that? No, I agree. No, I, was, I agree as well with Ralph. I think it's, uh, it's very much a balance whereby, you know, we're, we're in an era now of short form content with, with tweets and, and using social media to communicate. But how can you, you know, where is the art of storytelling in a, you know, 180 character tweet or whatever it might be? There's, there's limited ability there. So there needs to be a balance whereby you can maybe gain interest through short form content. But long form content, whether through magazines or books, whether through documentaries through Amazon and Netflix or OTT or on TV, is also very important. So I think rather than focusing solely on, on, on communicating short form, long form is also very important still. So I'm going to throw out the next question for you guys. And this one's a little controversial. We've seen the Come hashtag on. fake news out there everywhere. Now, it took me a while to understand what a hashtag was, I thought it was just another thing to add to uh, my smothered, covered, and chunked. But we see the fake news hashtag out there so often today, and there is a reason for that, though, too. How do we get race fans to trust that we are telling them the whole story nowadays and get them to believe it? I'll take it. Well... I, I think it, it's a two-way street, right? We, we in the media have to be responsible. We have to be the ones who are, try, are doing our best to get the most accurate information possible. I would also say, I'll just use an example from here. I was totally thrilled earlier today that somebody was up here talking about that your first experience at the racetrack isn't always the best experience, that that can happen. Because too many times... I've come to business, sports business conferences, and I see somebody from the racing industry fairly high up say, if we can just get them in the door, they're going to be a fan for life. And I see them tearing down stands every week. And then, so <laughs> they used to be full. So they're, they're, the whole point is that if, if, we, if, we, if everybody, you know, again, are in, we got to be accurate, we got to do our... Um, our best, but it comes down to relationships, and it comes down to feeling that everybody is being honest with each other. And I think there's sometimes, and Grant, I'm a media person, so I'm, I'm biased, but I feel like, are there any South Park fans in here? Do people here watch South Park? Is this a yes. South Park crowd? Okay, it's what I call Officer Barbrady Syndrome. There are too many people uh, who I deal with who are like, no news here, nothing to see here, and the house is burning <laughs> down behind them. Right. And so when when and, and and so when I deal with that and then the next time I'm coming back to them with something and I'm trying to get a straight answer, that that's where you that's where you probably start thinking you start hearing other things and you and you probably get accused of either fake news or conspiracy theory. But it all becomes because you don't because the media and the people we deal with don't necessarily always have the trust in each other. And it's about building relationships. And, and it's, it's incumbent on all of us. Sometimes we spend too much time on our, on our phone texting or emailing and not just sitting around talking. I told you he spends a lot of time in the NASCAR <laughs> Media Center. Next up, Rob. Uh, look, look, you earn it. Um, Speed Sport's been in existence since 1934. It's 83 years old. Our other brand, Sprint Car Midget, is 16 years old. I've been holding a microphone on national TV for 30 years. I got that interview with Dale Earnhardt because I earned it. That's what you have to do. The first time you burn somebody in this business, you're done. That's the one thing we all know. Those that are truly worthy of the titles of holding the mic flag or whatever it might be, have earned that respect from the garage area, from the industry insiders, so forth and so on. And you're either able to continue that and keep that, or you're going to lose it. And I think the fans figure that out pretty fast, too as does the entire industry, so that people are going to work with you and give you the story based on whether or not they believe you deserve that because they know then that the readership, the viewership is going to come along because they trust you. Um, I think everybody in motorsport, I'll use Formula One as an example again, um, has an agenda. 
So if you're a race team, a series, a supplier, an OEM, a sponsor, um, you've got an agenda and often, you know, that's tied to something commercial. Um, and I think because of that, you know, with, with Formula One and with Bernie, it was very much a closed shop for a long time. And I think some fans feel, you know, they're never getting the full picture. And often, you know, certain information is either withheld or is, or is shrouded behind a curtain. So um, I think the example with, um, with Liberty Media now coming in and, and, and being more open with Formula One hopefully should build the trust again with some of the fans from Formula One that have clearly left or have taken a step back from it. Um, I just think, you know, being more open with the media, giving the media more access beyond what, what's currently happening. And I use Formula One as the main example. I know it's, it, it keeps coming up. But if, I think if that happens, then those that may have lost an element of trust will hopefully trust again. Jonathan, you actually get into that sort of a deal because doing play-by-play, -play, you can get into the habit of almost making every routine pass sound like the greatest thing of all time. But you do a great job of avoiding that uh, and saving the theatrics for the important things. Well, I hope so. Um, and you're right. Um, it, it, you know, it, you, you are always teetering between the balance between creating excitement when there is none. And let's face it, guys, we've all seen the, some of the most boring races in the world. Uh, and, you know, thankfully someone like Ralph's calling it or hopefully, you know, somebody good because they can keep you going and keep your, your show alive. And it is a show, let's face it. Uh, and then when it happens naturally um, and there's a big crash or, the, or there's a, a, a battle for the, for the last, you know, couple of seconds, then it's, it, it tells its own story. And some Sometimes commentators like myself can shut the hell up sometimes because you don't need to speak because it's there for everyone to see. I would say this about fake news. As a whole, as a conglomerate in this room, we have been very, very lucky that the people who in, are involved in this industry are both educated, generally speaking, responsible human beings um, who are either involved in safety or involved in responsibility from a law point of view or from a sanctioning point of view. Uh, and from us, from a media, I think, you know, the media is still flush with, this media is still flush with some very good journalists. But as we open the doors to social media, as we open the doors to more and more streaming and more and more guys who want to come to the 500 to cover it because it's a good race, I think that those who give those passes out, uh, those that allow people to have a microphone, those that allow to uh, you know, preach their stuff on social media, I think we all need to be responsible that if there is a bad or rotten egg, we all need to get rid of those guys because fake news could kill this industry. And what I mean by that is, look at how Schumacher's situation has been dealt with brilliantly, in my opinion. Um, a massive loss to the whole industry. Um, and um, I think the way that they have dealt with that story and are dealing with that story is very responsible. Uh, and if you only have to look at the mainstream media at the moment in news, and I'm a big news hand and I watch everything, um, you know, it's getting out of it's getting out of whack, and we don't know who to believe. And there are, you know, literally organisations politically trying now to sway us one way or another. And if this industry does one thing, um, you know, we are dealing with people's lives. When a Justin Wilson, when a Dan Weldon, when uh, you know a Michael Schumacher incident happens, we have to collectively be responsible for the information and the message that either comes out of our circuit or our, our mouths or whoever we're working for. Uh, and I think, like I said, it could kill us if we don't uh, make sure that we're responsible because I think fake news would be awful for this industry. Great answers by all. Okay, now the time that you guys have all been sitting up on stage waiting for me to say this is the last question that I have for you, but I've saved the best for last. And there are rules that go on this. First of all, um, for my Brits, you understand what Mount Rushmore is? Oh, yeah. All right. Thank goodness. I always have to double check. It's been closed, things. hasn't it? It's one of the monuments. <laughs> it's closed been recently, no? Yeah. So we got four. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so here's, here's how we're doing this. It's the Mount Rushmore of greatest motorsports journalists. But I'm only going to have, have you name one. And you cannot name anyone up on the stage. Oh, no. And... You cannot mention anyone who gets mentioned by anyone else up on stage. Oh, this is... So I make it really tough for you because it's the incentive to go first. So who wants to go first? <laughs> Peter. Uh, without a shadow of a doubt, it's Murray Walker. You bastard. 
<laughs> <laughs> you knew I was going to say that. I, 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 anyway, go on. Yeah, Murray Walker, you know, he's been in the industry for decades. He's, what is he now, 93, 94 years old? He's still going. He's still going. Um, iconic, you know, his voice was, was more iconic than Formula One, arguably, for a long time. People associated Formula One with him. So, um, yeah, I can't, I can't look beyond him. He would be my single face on Mount Rushmore. There you go. Next up. <laughs> I'm looking at Ralph. I'll go with Chris Konamaki. I mean, I'll take a, I'm going to take the easy one if you guys are... That wasn't, that's just not right. I, I own his paper. <laughs> okay, so you two went with Murray? You're good? No, 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 I, I've got my own now. I'm not allowed to now. So I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to be, I, I was going to say Murray, because like I said, he was my hero. But I will say now, having been in the States, and I've been looking for, uh, and I said, as I said, I grew up here, but now I'm kind of living here, and I'm kind of obviously following the American side of things far more closely uh, than ever I did. And I thought I invented the pit walk, um, but I didn't, um, clearly. Um, and I also thought I was funny. Uh, when I had a microphone, but I'm not as funny because I think my hit, my new hero and the man I would definitely put on Rap Marshall, especially if we're talking Americans, is Robin Miller because I think uh, he is, he is without doubt, he, he is a 25-year-old in a far older body and I want to be just like him when I grow up. That's very good and you stole mine. So now oh, I got to come up with a new one, but that's great answer. Great answer indeed. Ralph. Well, the, the proper answer really is Chris, uh, that Bob said. I mean, he's the Dean of American Motorsports Journalism, so that, 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 that is the number one. Um, the number two is somebody, uh, and, and Robin is certainly a great one as well. Uh, to me, uh, as a guy who is a, a dear friend and a great mentor and one of the best voices in our business as well, and that's Dave Despain. Yeah, yeah. Here, here, here. Here. Yes, very good. There are just so many that you could name. But those were great choices all. And thanks for you for uh, mentioning Robin Miller. Uh, Robin's been a good friend of RTBC here, and we're, uh, we're happy to, to see her that name mentioned up here. All right, guys. It comes to that time that you get one past last parting shot. <laughs> so we're going to start right here where we began. Go ahead, Jonathan. To sum up or... Yeah, just last, last parting thought for the class. Last parting thought. Thank you so much um, to make me part of this. Thank you, Tim, uh, for inviting me. Um, and thanks, guys. It's been fun. Um, I've really enjoyed a, this a lot. I, I'm looking forward to also staying around in Indianapolis and hopefully catching up with some of you guys because I've got so much to learn about American motorsport um, and I continue to travel around the world, so I think I've got a pretty good perspective on the other worlds of motorsport. Um, so I'm really looking forward to being part of this and hopefully for a long time to come, but I'm really enjoying being in America. Um, I think uh, the Indy 500 that I was at last year, or this year, excuse me, uh, sums up everything we've been talking about because you talk about storytelling and story writing. I rewrote or re kind of hashed in my head what a great story it would be if Scott Dixon won. What a great story it would be if this guy won. What a great story. And then if Scorsato wins. And that's a great story. Um, you know, there's just there's so much in this sport that makes, like I said, our lives easy because it's drama packed. Uh, and, and I feel really, very privileged uh, to be part of it. I've got one funny story to tell you. As you all watch the American Formula One Grand Prix, you'll have seen Michael Buffer introducing the drivers, right? Quite a bold move, right? And I am the kind of voice of the circuit, so I was in on all the meetings. Um, and I was, of course, I'm a big fan of Michael Buffer. And so we're in the meetings, and of course, Michael's not coming till, you know, the actual day. So um, they were like, hey, we've got a rehearsal. Would you... Uh, you know, step in and sit in for, for Mr. Buffer. And I said, oh, yeah, okay. Lonzo! And I was doing the whole thing, you know. Daniel Kivat, the human torpedo! The whole thing, right? And, and, I'm, and it's echoing across the circuit of the Americas. If you've ever been there and the, the stands are empty, it really does echo. So what a great thing for me. And I'm having the time of my life. And I've got the FOM guys in my ear saying, okay, cut to camera two, cut to camera three. All right, okay, Michael Buffer do this, Michael Buffer read this. And afterwards, um, I've finished the whole thing. And of course, if you know the Formula One guys, which you do, they're all English. 
So I put the microphone, I said, I said, is that it? And the guy goes, yeah, thanks, mate, that was great. And I said, oh, it's all right, mate, that's okay, that's fine. He goes, bloody hell, you're from England. And I said, yeah, I'm from, from fucking England, why? And he goes, he goes, what, you go around the world impersonating Michael Buffer all day? <laughs> and I said, yeah, that, that, that's actually what I do, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's my parting shot. Very good. If nice you ever need story. a Michael Buffer impersonator. <laughs> Peter. Uh, well, yeah, thank you, Tim, and everybody. It's been really enjoyable. I always enjoy coming to, uh, to this event. And I think for me, it's really the whole day in focus is, is the importance of uh, having the ability to communicate with your peers about the challenges we're all facing, whether you're a circuit operator or, you know, working, uh, working, to, uh, or working directly with a rights holder or increasing fan engagement with what you're doing. I think without this, you know, the, the, the industry won't grow. So I'm just glad to be a part of it. Bob. Uh, first off, thank you all for sticking around before the bar opens. I feel like I'm infringing on, <laughs> fringing on your bar time. But if I can leave you with one thing, it's when I worked at Daytona, you know, we'd have races there for, for three weeks. You had the Rolex and then in the speed weeks. And my editor always told me, he said, give me a story my wife would read. Because his wife wasn't a race fan. And I know that as a track operator, you may want your champion to get all the get as much publicity as possible but fr from a media standpoint they're going to want something that resonates with race fans and non-race fans and so you know hey if you have somebody who's been if you if your greeter at the gate has been there for 20 years th that could be a story if somebody is um if, if you have a, a a driver who is uh you know 50 and it's their first time and they just decide to go do it that might be a story. Anything that is a little bit different, that is a, that that your story can def, can be something that can't be told at other tracks, uh, is more likely to get attention from from the media. Ralph, take us home. As you're thinking about what you're going to do in 2018, don't just think about social media and don't just think about buying ads. Find a media partner, somebody who's really interested in working with you that can help tell your story, help build that drama, help build stars for you. Hopefully it's us at Speed Sport and Sprint Car Midget. It might be Bob. It might be any one of these guys. It might be somebody who's on the show floor. It might be the guy at your local newspaper. But if they're really a good media partner, they will work with you. Sure, everybody's got to make a living. So, yeah, maybe you have to buy an ad every now and then, but so what? If you're working with a good media partner, you're gonna get a lot more back anyway that's gonna more than cover the cost of that ad you buy. And you want him to survive anyway, because even after you buy that ad, he's still gonna do more stuff on you than you've already talked about, because he needs the stories. Because we're all ultimately content shops in one form or another. So find yourself a good media partner this year and help build both businesses so everybody is strong and it's great seeing everybody great seeing so many old friends again happy holidays everybody and uh thank you tim as always my friend and come by and see us at booth 4928 what did we learn from our media panel we learned a lot and we learned that these guys prefer to ask the questions more than they prefer to answer them but that's too bad that's my job you're not getting it uh, rivalries, that's what we learned. Whether it's manufacturer, whether it's just two guys bumping into each other, whether it's two guys that just hate each other. I've seen family squabbles out at Rockford Speedway. Rivalries matter, they sell. Why? Because it matters to the fans. Also, what is good racing? It means different things to different people. You need to know your audience as well as they know your product. And finally, we have lots of great people reporting this sport, and we've got a great example right here. Let's give them a hand.